But the fact that both Chris Taylor and Mookie Betts get in is a joke. Look, I know Mookie Betts is the name and all that stuff. Mookie Betts is hitting under 250 and he has 10 home runs. I mean, my goodness, that's that, that's a number seven hitter on most teams. Now, I know he brings other things to the table, but the fact that Mookie Betts was into the All-Star game before Manny Machado is a joke. And um, don't tell me that, oh, well, Mookie Betts can play the outfield, blah, blah, blah. Look, don't, don't give me that. You can... <laughs> What is up, everyone? Brandon First, a.k.a. First Report, representing the First Off the Bench podcast network. Everyone comes off the bench. We are first. Welcome into another edition of The Changeup here on the network, where we break down everything in the world of baseball, mainly Major League Baseball. With me today, as always, is my co-host, Brianna Winner. You can find Brianna at bwinner12. Brianna, how you doing today? I'm doing good. Excited to talk baseball. We're almost at All-Star Weekend, but how are you doing? I'm good. You know, it's uh, like you said, All-Star Weekend. I think it's the time where you can actually look at the standings um, and you don't get kind of yelled at. Oh, it's still early. You know, things like that. We're finally getting into the point. You know, if you look at the division standings, which we will get to later on in the show, um, you're you're really getting a really good sense of who's probably going to be uh, playing in October and who won't be, or at least uh, contending for that. But the All-Star <laughs> Weekend's always a lot of fun. Uh, it's always a lot of fun because, you know, you get to kind of see the, the the best players. And I think the best exhibition in all of professional sports is the Home Run Derby. Um, we will get to that as well. Before we get to, into too deep into all this, you can find myself at First Report, F-E-R-S-T, and the podcast network as a whole, at Off the Bench 1-2 on Twitter. Uh, so getting started is, uh, I guess, kind of the news of the week in baseball, and uh, it's not great. Honestly, look, if you're a baseball fan, uh, if you're a human, uh, it's, it's, it's a really crappy story to even be talking about, to acknowledge, but we have to do it. It is the situation that Trevor Bauer finds himself in, and no, we're not talking about sticky stuff or tweets. Um, this is, these are actions, um, a criminal complaint, a criminal um, case has been filed against Trevor Bauer in regards um, to his interaction with a female who he met online and then had a uh, intimate relationship with. Uh, then you can feel free to go on, uh, do a quick Google search. You will find the charges there. You will find the allegations there. I'm not going to get into them here. Uh, they're, to be honest, uh, they're, they're pretty gruesome and um, it's, it's well above my pay grade. On this, uh, unfortunately, um, the only thing I can hope for is that justice prevails. And I'll tell you this right now, if um, this is found that Trevor Bauer did these things without her consent, then um, I don't think we should ever see Trevor Bauer um, on the baseball field ever again, um, let alone walking the streets for a very long time. But once again, um, above my pay grade, and there's plenty to get to, he has been placed on a seven-day administrative leave. I don't think anyone expects him back anytime soon. Um, look, this is this is really messed up. It's a bad, bad, bad situation, no matter what. Obviously, for Trevor Bauer, secondary, of course, is the Dodgers and their predicament. Um, but before we get it too deep into that, Brianna, what are your thoughts on um, the Trevor Bauer situation? Well, they are about 100% sure that it's going to last longer than the seven days uh, because they still have to go through the investigation. Um, they still have to go through all of this. So MLB and Dodgers are not expecting him back anytime soon. I mean, you'll be able to find the pictures online. So again, we probably shouldn't be talking more about this uh, or the details going into this. Uh, if you want to know more, you should probably just look it up online. Yeah, this isn't the podcast uh, that's going to break down uh, criminal sides of things, but this is a podcast that's going to break down the baseball side of things. And um, it might seem a little insensitive and definitely, definitely secondary in nature, but the real is, realistic situation is the Dodgers lost one of their best pitchers. Um, how long? We don't know. But once again, it's a baseball mm -hmm. podcast, so we are going to have to you know, talk about what the Dodgers have to do. Obviously, they have David Price 
you know, who's been in the bullpen, has been struggling to kind of get those. The loss of Dustin May, you know, early on in the year, that really hurts now with this. Once again, we're, we're probably not going to see Bauer back this year. Um, and who knows what goes on from there, if we'll ever see him um, in a Dodgers uniform, depending on what happens. But for the Dodgers, obviously, in the thick of the National League West race, um, have been on a tear of late. Uh, we'll dive into them, unfortunately, a little later when we get into our three up, three down segment. But uh, yeah, for the Dodgers, it's not great, obviously, to lose one of your best players. But in this fashion, it's very, very um, unfortunate, um, but not nearly as nearly as important as what needs to be done in terms of Major League Baseball's investigation. I think it needs to be secondary. Um, take a step back, let the authorities do their investigation. Um, and then because uh, I, I don't think the authorities are going to be okay with Major League Baseball tagging along in that investigation, um, nor should they. So once again, um, the MLB investigation is secondary here. Uh, the criminal investigation is first and foremost, and that will be worked out. Um, but yeah, from the baseball side of things, it's not great um, for, for the Dodgers. They're definitely a team that has plenty of bullets down in that minor league system, but I don't think they wanted to have to deal with it um, in this way. But as Brianna said, I don't think anyone expects Bauer back anytime soon. And that includes uh, manager Dave Roberts um, in those situations. And at the end of the day, uh, you, you know, he's not getting any, any, any favors, any special treatment from the commissioner, um, nor should he in this situation, but obviously mainly because of his past interactions with uncle Rob. Um, but moving on to some real baseball that was played on the field. It was in Omaha. Of course, last week we talked about um, the, unfortunate situation um, for NC State. Uh, what could have been for them, they could have possibly gone on and, and represented uh, their side of the bracket, but instead it was Vanderbilt. Vanderbilt won game one, but Mississippi State comes back and wins games two and three, including beating Kamar Rocker, who is expected to be a first-round pick in this year's draft. Um, they get the job done. They win their first ever national championship as a school. Any sport, any any gender, anything. Um, they get their first win for Mississippi State, which kind of blew my mind because um, they've been around for obviously a very long time and they are a power five school. But Mississippi State, congratulations to them um, taking down Vanderbilt in the College World Series um, a year or a, a year after we didn't have a champ national champion. But Brianna, what are your thoughts on the College World Series and maybe some interesting uh, nuggets you found? I mean, we both thought that Vanderbilt was going to win, but again, that didn't happen. I'm glad Mississippi State was able to do something that no other team had been able to do at the school um, in general. So congrats to you guys. Um, again, I found some stats on Twitter. Uh, so the NCAA Women's College World Series did average 59% more viewers than the Men's College World Series. The, and the most viewed softball game averaged 24% more. So the Women's College World Series Average was 1.2 million. The most viewed was 2.1. Tournament average for College World Series, 755,000. The most viewed game, 1.7 million. And it wouldn't surprise me if that was one of the last games of the year. So, I mean, come on, NCAA. You know what you got to do. And one of the comments even said, imagine what the numbers would have been had the championship game in the Women's College World Series had not been played at 2 o'clock on a Wednesday afternoon and instead later in the evening where people were not at work. Yeah. The numbers it, would have been so much different. Yeah. Uh, and, and I don't quite, you know, obviously know why that's a situation. I mean, ESPN has like 900 channels. Um, I'm pretty sure they could put the World Series of Poker, you know, on a different day, something like that, whatever it is, cornhole. Uh, just me, just my thoughts. And, and you're, you're completely correct in that summation that, you know, the, it, it beat the College World Series and most of those games were played when people are at work, um, you know, and, and that's 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 crazy. Great for the sport of softball. Um, great for both both groups of athletes, not just in the College World Series, but, you know, all the players, they didn't. This was the one sport or at least the spring sports last year didn't get to do uh, to finish it off. Some of them didn't even get to play at all. So, you know, just congratulations to all of those student athletes who were able to compete. Obviously, you know, um, some were more successful than others, but that's life. Uh, luckily, um, for the most part right now, most people, um, not everyone gets a trophy in, in major sports. So that's still the case. But for all the players just to be out there and showcase their skills, 
uh, very, very, uh, very appreciative of them going out there and entertaining us. And, and once again, congratulations to, you know, the Women's College World Series, who I would have to imagine that's the first time that's ever happened um, and, and definitely is a positive sign for um, that, that, uh, that venue and that uh, event going forward. So moving on to the all-star game, or at least the all-stars themselves, they have been announced and at the headline at the top of the list, once again, folks, it's, it's the history maker himself, uh, Shohei Otani. He makes even more history, becomes of course the first player to be selected as position player and pitcher. Now, obviously Babe Ruth, um, did this, you know, back in the day, um, 14, 15 years before the all-star game was introduced. Would he have been a, uh, all-star both ways? That doesn't really matter. He definitely would have been one as a, as a hitter. Doesn't really matter. Shohei Otani, what he's doing right now is not even comparable. Babe Ruth wasn't even on these, th this level. Um, and it, it's, it's absolutely remarkable, but we'll send it over to you, Brianna, obviously Shohei, uh, right in your neck of the woods, you get the opportunity to enjoy him for quite a while. But what are your thoughts on Shohei? Surprising really no one, but making even more history. I mean, look, he's the first player to do this. It's, he's been making history all year. Kevin Cash is okay with him being able to play both positions during this game, which I don't know for how long the entire game, but at least for an inning on both sides. So we'll never know. But, I mean, he also has tied the record for the uh, most, for the home runs in a season by a Japanese player. And it's not even All-Star Weekend yet. That, that just tells you the kind of player that he is. Yeah. And I will mention the number of those home runs in the winner's circle. So there's going to be more. Yeah, definitely. It's, it's very, very tough to kind of quantify what Shohei Otani has done. Um, obviously Babe Ruth, yes, is always that benchmark. It's, it's a completely different game now uh, on so many different levels, other than the fact that there's four bases and, and there's a wood, uh, wooden bat and a, and, a, and a ball. Other than that, it's essentially a different game. Let's, for Shohei Otani to be in this situation, um, it's, it's magical, I believe. Really, if you're a baseball fan, this is what you've, kind of been waiting for um as, as a whole question for you mm -hmm. do you think there's going to be more players like Shohei Otani where they're going to be playing both sides and maybe making it on an all-star team playing both sides not this way um not I I I, if I find it very hard to believe I will be I will be surprised if there's another two-way player that comes around and makes the all-star team in one of those capabilities because you have to be, it's so hard to, I mean, just play a position 140 games a year, let alone then sprinkle in your 25 starts. Uh, it's it's, it's mind-numbing to me. I don't think anyone um, going forward can do this now it was probably what was said, you know, when, when, when someone first hit 50 home runs in three years in a row, and now, you know, plenty of people do it or at least get close to it. Um, so it, it could be coming, but for me, I don't, I don't see it happening anytime soon. We had, you know, certain players that could come up, you know, obviously Rick and Keel was one guy that um, he pitched and then could swing an okay bat had to you know leave pitching and then focus fully on position player to come back um he was a guy who made an all-star team as a pitcher and a hitter now i think they were like eight years apart or something like that it, it, i don't think so shohei otani is is not human really in in the spectrum of things i mean it's it's hard enough to do what he does at the plate just by itself let alone what he does i mean he's, he could win the cy young and the mvp I mean, I don't have any, I, I, I can't even quantify that. And he won't win the Cy Young, unfortunately. I mean, but it, it, he's going to be in the top 10 voting, which is just ridiculous, ridiculous, ooh, ridiculousness in itself. Um, I, I, I can't stop talking about this guy because he is, he's a creative player. He really is. He is a creative player on your favorite PlayStation Xbox game. Um, I can't wait to keep watching him. I'm, I'm incredibly jealous of Brianna and all the Angel fans who 
who are going to have him for, you know, X number of years. Um, and, and they also have Mike Trout. I mean, get this team into the playoffs, damn it. But um, anyways, uh, it, it, it's really awesome, not only for the sport, but also for Japan. Uh, I can't even imagine what it's like over there. Um, he, he's got to be an absolute rock star. I remember Dice K and Hideo Nomo when they came over, it was a media circus. This is like a media stampede or whatever's higher than a circus. I don't, I, I'm not sure, but it, it's, it's fantastic for the country. Um, that is already baseball mad. Um, and who knows, do I think, let me put it to you this way. And this might be a little controversial, but it is what it is. Get over it. I don't think if we do see another player like this, I don't think it comes from the United States. And the reason I say that is whether for positive or negative reasons, other countries, they, they try, they train harder as kids, they play more. Um, and it's, it's, it's a lifestyle as opposed to an intramural or a hobby for some of these kids in America. Um, you see it in the little league world series, every team that comes out of Japan um, is probably going to make it to the final because they practice 12 hours a day. Is it right? Is it wrong? That's not really for here. But my, my thing that I would, I guess my caveat to the answer to that question would be, I don't think we'll see ever see an American born player do what Shohei Otani has done just because of the way baseball is taught in America. Um, it's, it's kind of secondary, um, which is fine. I don't think, you know, I'd want my kid to be out on the field 12 hours a day, five days a week playing baseball. That might be a bit much, but it works for some people. And for, uh, I think that's kind of how you have to get to Shohei Otani's level. Um, practice, practice, practice. But I just can't wait to watch this guy in the home run derby and then see how Kevin Cash is going to use him. Um, I would love to see him start the game and then go out to right. I don't know if Joe Madden, I think he'd probably want it the other way around, put him out in right field and then have him throw an inning. We'll see how that goes. Um, but either way, we just get to enjoy this guy. Um, I'm very so glad he's back, healthy and ready to win the MVP. So, and speaking of that home run derby, we do have two more participants um so six of the eight have been named salvador perez and matt olson will both join the all-star or the excuse me the home run derby obviously matt olson of the a's salvador perez of the royals i'll just say this right now for salvador perez obviously doesn't jump off the page as a home run hitter but this is probably one of the more underrated catchers of our generation you talk about Posey, you talk about Molina, you talk about Grandal, you talk about all those guys. Salvador Perez is right there with every single one of them. He's got his ring. He's been um, a, a fantastic backstop. I think it's great. He's having another great season. He'll start for the uh, American League for a team that he's stuck with. Um, you know, he got his ring, but I don't think they're going to be anywhere near that for the rest of his career there in Kansas City. But uh, congrats to Salvador Perez. And for Matt Olson, we'll see what he can do. Um, I like the guy. I, I, um, I don't know if he'll, he'll kind of contend with the big, big guns with Trevor Story or, uh, you know, even, even Shohei, obviously, who I think everyone is pulling for. But uh, I'll, I'll, I'll put it to you, Brianna. Who do you think right now? Now, obviously, there's two more participants. Um, who, I know who you're pulling for. I know who you're pulling for. Um, are, you, are you expecting anyone to challenge Shohei? If anyone was to challenge him, I think it would have been Guerrero, but he's not participating. I mean, it's all just going to depend on who's on that day. So, like, if they're in a great hitting streak, because these are going to come back to back, then fine. Then you've got competition, but otherwise, you won't know until you get there. Yeah. I think with this new format, or I guess it's not new anymore in the Home Run Derby, but it's not outs anymore. It's it's a time situation. I think it's players with kind of those smooth swings that are going to be um, better off because they don't wear themselves out with the long rangy strokes and you know, things like that. Um, that's why I think Shohei is definitely the favorite here. I will throw one out there. Um, and look, I always have a soft spot for Trevor Story. I feel like he's a guy, um, obviously, he'll be playing in his home field. He's on a team that he's got to kind of look around. It's like that Will Smith meme, right? Where he's just looking around the last, last episode of Fresh Prince of Bel-Air and everything's gone and he's just realizing he's the only one there. I mean, really, tulowitzki has gone. Um, um, obviously, arenado has gone. LeMayhew. And yeah, LeMayhew, exactly. And, I, and he's, he's stuck there. You know, Charlie Blackman's still there. Don't get me wrong. That's, that's uh, nice. But he's going to be a free agent at the end of the year. 
Uh, it'd be a great little kind of send off to Colorado. And then obviously, look, you got the defending champion Alonzo, who once again, I, I don't know um, if that swing can do it two years in a row, but, uh, or, well, I'm sorry, two out of the last three years. I know obviously there wasn't one last year, but um, really, really excited to see the home run derby. Like I said, it's my favorite exhibition, um, sorry, skills competition or, or, uh, you know, um, slam dunk or three point contest. But for me, the home run derby is the king of the kind of all-star game festivities um, in all the major sports. But moving on to something that will be going on a little bit later in the summer, um, kind of probably been taking a back seat in your mind. It is Tokyo. Um, the Olympic team was announced. Uh, the United States will be heading to Tokyo, obviously, to play a little bit of baseball. Um, I believe maybe the last uh, Olympics. I think next time breakdancing took it over. Don't even talk. Don't even get me started on that. Don't we get don't me enough. started. That's, they're yeah. going to have to try to get it back when it's in L.A. Yeah, well, and, and that's the thing that really kind of makes me a little upset is it will come back. And at this point, now it's just becoming like regional Olympics, right? Like, um, oh, we're in, I think it's France, right? Uh, yes, and, 24 yeah, is so, France. Yeah, so, so France, it, baseball isn't big there. Um, okay, so then, you know, we come back to LA. I'm sorry. I know breakdancing is big in LA, but we need to, we need to play some baseball in the LA Olympics. Let's, let's be honest. Uh, in softball, definitely. I apologize. The, the, the yes, thing with the softball is, I know, I understood why they wanted to get rid of it because out of the only Olympics that it was, because it only started in 96 and they got rid of it in 2008, the US had basically won every single one of them except for 08 when Tokyo, when Japan ended up beating them. And then it has been gone for 12 years. So I, I understand that aspect because they want more people to build up their programs, but like, come on, it's every four years. You basically got rid of the chance for a lot of these players to even be Olympians. And a lot of the softball players, a lot of them have trying to come out of retirement to play on this Olympic team. But most of the team's going to be college players with the exception of like Kat Osterman or Monica Abbott, who has play, already played in two Olympics. Yeah, they're probably Kat going Osterman's to be- still, yeah. Kat Osterman's still running around? Yeah, and they're, oh they're probably gonna be done after yeah. this Olympics. Yeah. But there are so many people that want the opportunity. Yeah, that's um, it's a great point. And, you know, obviously uh, for, for baseball and softball, um, you, you have your, your big powers, but that's kind of how it is for all Olympic sports. You know, you, you talk about whatever figure skating, the Russians are going to be good. You know, the Americans are going to be good. That's just kind of how it always is. Um, I mean, even, even basketball, it's, it's very rare. You see anybody outside of the United States. Now it's obviously a reason that football um, isn't in the Olympics. Uh, I think the U S would, would kind of dominate that as well. But for, for the Olympic team, obviously the reason I did kind of want to bring this up, like I, talked with Brianna about um, any chance I get to kind of uh, take some shots at Matt Kemp I will um, and yeah he did not make the Olympic team after being on like the the qualifier and the preliminary roster um, so congratulations to Matt Kemp and missing out um, obviously I'm not a big fan of the guy um, and um, don't really care to hide that but for others obviously a great story you're going to see a lot of minor leaguers uh, mixed in you know there's Edwin Jackson um, uh, Todd Frazier, Tim Fedorovich, uh, a couple guys who have, you know, had some major league years, um, but now uh, probably riding off into the sunset. But one last chance, hey, go get a gold medal, uh, if possible, obviously, in Japan, um, where the Olympics are going to be held, obviously, it's going to probably be between those two teams, the Cubans are always there as well. Uh, really, really interesting to see that. Very, very excited to see who kind of uh, challenges those big three. Obviously, um, I, I think the Dominican throws a team in there as well. I'm sure if they do, they're going to be a big time power as well. So really, really excited um, for the Olympics. I'll be honest, baseball isn't like my favorite summer Olympic sport. Um, I, I feel like they throw that in at like two in the morning. So it's kind of hard to follow. Um, definitely a big fan of the track and field and the swimming, but we'll be keeping an eye on the Olympic team as they go for gold, um, both baseball and softball. Um, as Brianna the Olympics said. do start at the end of July. Yes. So we're only a few weeks out. And you know what? I will say one more thing. And I know probably it, it's hard to change a logo and all that stuff, but can we stop calling it the 2020 Olympics? Can we all just acknowledge 
that we missed a year. Okay, it's the 2021 Olympics. They're not going to change the logo because that's too much money. Exactly, much I understand. So. But my goodness, it's 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 just it's crazy. The, the Euros for soccer are doing the same thing. Like, come on, people. It's like obviously online. It's going to be 2020, but everybody knows it's going to technically be 2021. Yeah. Yeah. Everybody's just calling it Tokyo at this point. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Tokyo Olympics, period. Uh, but, you know, we'll have Winter Olympics next year, too, so we won't have to wait too much longer. But with that, it is time to dive into the winner's circle. Obviously, Brianna going to be talking about some All-Stars. I believe uh, the nice nice little health, healthy dose of All-Stars there for the Angels. Um, and then I know you said there's a bit of a tough week coming up. Yeah, so obviously they've been six and four in their last 10. They're two and a half games back of the Mariners, which I will get to that in a few, like in a minute or two. Um, first, we're going to go into the injury <laughs> report for the Angels because Rendon and Ward did make early exits on during Sunday's game. Rendon with a left hamstring tightness and Ward with his right index finger. And then Upton is also out with a sore back and he's expected to be on the injured list beyond the 10 days. So that we're shorthanded and come on, Rendon, like this is the fourth time that you've been injured this year. So get, get yourself together. Um, so Otani does lead the league with 31 home runs. He did this most recent home run against the Orioles on Sunday. Hopefully he can do another one and just maybe break that history of the most home runs by a Japanese born player. Uh, I'm sure it'll happen in the next few weeks. Um, but so they've won, t- they won two of three versus the Yankees after basically sweeping the Orioles. Um, but one game did get postponed uh, to August 19th because of, or not August 19th, August 18th. I'm going to assume because of weather. Um, but in their 11 to 8 win, um, Otani had his worst start of the year. He only was able to record two outs. And, but he gave up seven runs, two hits, four walks, and only had one strikeout. I'm really hoping that that's not what's going to happen tonight. It better not happen tonight. Um, so again, they did sweep the Orioles. And then last night, they lost five to four against the Red Sox. So again, Otani is pitching tonight versus the Red Sox. They're going to finish this series tomorrow before three games against the Mariners right before the All-Star break. And all of those Games are going to be important, especially if they want to overtake the Mariners for third. And then especially after the All-Star break, they go back to playing the Mariners for another four games. So this is going to be a really tough, like, two weeks. Thankfully, they get a break over the weekend. So we'll see what happens. Maybe they'll turn into the Washington Nationals of 2019. And, okay, don't give me that look. Don't give me that look. You know what I'm talking about. So... Hopefully they'll overtake the Mariners, maybe the A's. Although again, I'm holding out hope for the A's to overtake the Astros at this point. But either way, I want the Angels to finish in second, no matter what it takes. If they don't win the uh, division, they don't win the division. I just want them to do well, like the 2019 Washington Nationals who were horrible prior to their all-star break and then ended up winning. Yeah. Um, I, I think, you know, having a good second half and finishing in second is definitely attainable. I don't think it'll be the ride the Nationals went on. Um, but who knows? I mean, look, if they get Mike Trout back, the way Shohei's playing, the way, you know, you got Matt uh, or uh, Jared Walsh, who's been absolutely, you know, fantastic, not only for your team, but my fantasy team, and I think yours as well. Um, so that's always a plus. But yeah, for the Angels, it's kind of like what I talked about earlier. You got two of the most electrifying players in all of baseball, at least when they're healthy. Well, and, and Trout has been hitting off of a tee, so he's there getting there. And and technically, look, he is an all-star starter. I think he he, he won't, he's not going to play. We know that. Um, but it still kind of shows you the star power he has, even though he's been out for, you know, better part of it. I did do some voting too, so. Oh, yeah, yeah. And and it is one of those things. Um, it, a lot of it is a popularity contest. And when he was held, I can't imagine, look, if, if Mike Trout, even if he missed the entire year and came back for the all-star game, um, I think you would have to put him in there because guess what? No matter what, he is the the all-star in all honesty. Although Shohei's definitely given a run for his money. But the Angels... But they're both uh, on the Angels. I don't care who gets it. <laughs> yeah. Um, it's it's a situation you kind of talk about. Look, you, if you're going to make a move on the Mariners, this is it. The next seven games, are, or eventually they'll get to a seven-game stretch where they're taking on no, nobody but the Mariners. And a good shot to try and at least tip the balance or at least take a bite out of something. 
and try and move forward. Um, but yeah, it's and all, all, all forces go hopefully. And um, for the angels, we just, like we said, we just want them in the playoffs healthy with the best players available, because I think all baseball fans want to see Shohei and Mike Trout in the uh, definitely in October, because that's, that's something we've been missing for a very long time. So moving on to the Padres who really, in all honesty, had the road trip from hell. Um, it really wasn't, uh, you know, great. I think they, they went three and three in those six games. But the reason it was the road trip from hell was because the East Coast threw everything that they could at the West Coast team, including seven delays in those six games, two in one game. Um, and then even the game on Sunday against the Phillies, uh, they, they started the game and they said, oh, there's zero percent chance of rain by the by the top of the ninth. They were in the middle of a downpour in a situation where the umpires pretty much refused to call the game because they needed to get the game in. Um, so they just came out and kept throwing dirt on the mound to keep going. Uh, Padres ended up winning that game 11 to one. They only had to kind of tough it out. By the end of the game, it was perfectly sunny out. Just kind of goes to show you the summer uh, weather back East, but for the Padres to go three and three in a situation where Jace Tingler really had to figure out how he was going to manage delays, bullpens, all kinds of things. Um, I think they can wear it as a badge of honor. They did lose game one last night on Monday, the 5th of July. Um, that was their first game back since that road trip to the Nationals in a situation. John Lester wasn't really that good, but he got some run support early. The Padres fought back after going down 5 nothing to get back to 5-5. Five, five. And two, two things that haven't really happened this year happened. And, and the first being Joe Musgrove kind of got touched up a bit, um, gave up five runs in five innings. I think, um, he, I mean, he gave up five runs in the first two innings in all honesty, then kind of settled himself down. But the second part of the un, unfortunate and, you know, things that don't normally happen to the Padres this year is the bullpen blew the game, uh, both um, Tim Hill and Pierce Johnson give up runs in the seventh and eighth innings and the Padres end up falling seven to five. Uh, so they lose to the Nationals and as good as the Padres have been since they are swept by the Rockies um, in the mid part of June, uh, they still have not made any ground up really on the Giants or the Dodgers. Four games behind the second place Dodgers, four and a half behind the Giants. Uh, good news is they are four games up on the Cincinnati Reds for the second playoff spot or the second wild card. Um, but if the season ended today, they'd have to go up to Dodger Stadium in a one-game playoff, which I don't know if um, I, my nerves could take that in all honesty. But plenty of baseball to be played going forward. Obviously, the Padres will take on the Nationals from here on out and then the Rockies before we head into the All-Star break. Hopefully the Padres can continue their winning ways uh, because this, at this point, playing 550, 600 ball just keeps you level in, in, in the West. Padres would be absolutely dominating the uh, NL East and would only be a game out in the NL Central. Um, but horseshoes and hand grenades, right? Um, at this, you, don't, you don't get to whine about what division you're in, unfortunately, but Padres just have to take what they can get. And they've been playing good ball. That's all you can ask for. Still the second half to play for. In terms of the All-Stars for the Padres, obviously Fernando Tatis becomes the first Padre since Tony Gwynn in 1999, which, to be honest, um, that, that for Tony Gwynn to be um, selected to the 1999 team as a starter was kind of a tip to the cap to him. Um, it was his last year in the league. He probably wasn't an All-Star, but... He obviously, him and Cal Ripken, it was their last All-Star game, so they started. Obviously, Tony Gwynn had a fantastic career uh, in, his, in its own self, but mainly talking, it's been 22 years since the Padres have essentially had the best position player at a position in the National League, and it's also a 22-year-old phenom who gets the most votes in the whole of the National League. Um, so congratulations to Tatis, made another fantastic catch last night. Go check it out bit gravity defying if you will uh, and then you had you Darvish who will be in the um, all-star game as well he'll get an inning or two as well um, with Mark Melanson the closer and Jake Cronenworth deservedly so does get in although I do have one bone to pick look Manny Machado doesn't have the greatest numbers in the world and maybe lower than what you would expect from Manny Machado 
but I think he deserved to get in either over. And now there's not really a ton of coincidence why I'm picking these two guys out because I hate the Dodgers. But the fact that both Chris Taylor and Mookie Betts get in is a joke. Look, I know Mookie Betts is the name and all that stuff. Mookie Betts is hitting under 250 and he has 10 home runs. I mean, my goodness, that's that that's the number seven hitter on most teams. Now, I know he brings other things to the table, but the fact that Mookie Betts was into the All-Star game before Manny Machado is a joke. And um, don't tell me that, oh, well, Mookie Betts can play the outfield, blah, blah, blah. Look, don't, don't give me that. You can find other ways to get it done. So Mookie Betts, I guess, you know, congratulations. I'm sure he spent some of that money to pay off some of those voters. And a lot of it is that popularity contest that I did talk about. Manny Machado outside of San Diego, not quite popular, but that's okay. We got the swag chain and everyone else has keys on lanyards. I don't know what else is going on, but for the Padres, the most starters or the most all-stars in the whole of the National League, uh, I believe the Blue Jays were the only team that had more in all of baseball. So congratulations to the Padres kind of shows you what's going on and turning uh, back into a, you know, really good baseball team after years of not being so. So with that, we dive into our three up three down segment. Brianna was in charge of the ups this week. So uh, Brianna, what's our first up for the week? I still hate saying it. Um, Our first up for the week is going to be the Dodgers. Look, before last night, they were tied for first um, in the National League West with San Francisco. They are now only half a game back. Obviously that is going to change, um, whether for the good or for the bad, we don't know. We hope for the bad. Yeah. Definitely. It's, it's tough with this team. And I know, look, we talked obviously early on about Bauer and how it will affect the Dodgers um, in, in those situations. They're, as you said, a half game out playing six, you know, better than 620 baseball, 53 and 32 will only get you a half game out in this division. Um, they have the highest, uh, the third highest run differential in all baseball. This is a team, even with the injuries, they still somehow are able to go out and, and are just superior in all kinds of ways. But eventually they're going to get to a point where, you know, enough is enough, I believe. Um, it, it's, it's really tough to see the Dodgers repeating if they're, unless they bring someone else in. Um, like it's I tough said, to see them go nine and one. Yeah. In their last oh, it's 10. definitely tough for a different reason. But uh, yeah, it's. <laughs> Compared to them down. <laughs> yeah, 100%. And it's. Um, a situation where the Dodgers now are, are probably the top buyers for starting pitching and they have plenty of, you know, options if they want to go that route, whether they want to pay somebody, um, you know, kind of a ridiculous amount of money or pick up the rest of their contract, or if they just give up some of their top prospects to get someone, we'll see how that goes. But for the Dodgers, ugh, like you said, it, we hate putting them here. We had to do it. They're on um, a tear. And unfortunately, they're uh, right there with the Giants. The Padres still cannot make up any ground on anyone in this division, unfortunately. But uh, moving on to a down that this is one that Brianna didn't want to uh, really. We knew it was coming, though, with their yeah. week. We knew it was coming. Yeah, I, I didn't know it was coming this drastically. I mean, I feel like two weeks ago, they, with, this was. But with who they were playing yeah. this week, we knew it was coming. <laughs> the, the Chicago Cubs, obviously, through that combined no hitter. After sweeping the, uh, taking two out of three from the Padres, I believe, head up to LA, um, and then uh, they they ran into a darn no no I apologize I take that back the Padres swept the Dodgers anyways the Cubs through that combined no hitter where Craig, Craig Kimball closed everything out since then they've yet to win a game um, they're definitely falling they're actually now in third place in the NL Central have lost ten games in a row. Um, everyone's mad, according to one quote <laughs> from, I think, David Ross. And well, I think you have to be right. Ten straight games um, going down since that uh, combined no hitter. I'm sure they'd love to say, hey, we go five and five if, or we'd like to go five and five if we could have just ended up just giving up a hit. I'm sure that would have been a fair trade. But that's a tough look for this team, um, a team that who knows, we thought maybe could have done some things uh, a little differently. But what are your thoughts, Brianna? I know it's a little close to home on this one. I mean, we didn't think they were going to win the division. I think this was around the place I thought they were going to be anyway. But there's no excuse for 0-10 in the last 10. There is no excuse for it. They are the only team that has done that in their last 10. Everybody else has at least won at least three games based on the standings I'm looking at right now. So the Cubs have no excuse. (laughs) 
even yeah. if they're one of my teams, they have no excuse. Exactly. I agree. It's uh, losing 10 games in a row, not, not really going to be excusable in any situation. Uh, really, really tough look for the Cubbies. But I mean, if there is one positive, there, there is time to turn it around. They got a lot of ground to make up in that division um, against a really good Brewers team. And uh, who they did, yeah, I think, get swept by last week, yeah. too. Oh, yeah. They've been, they've it been was bad. Kind of pushed around. It was yeah. really bad. But what's our second down of the week? Well, our second up. Or I'm sorry. Up. It's okay. You had the downs. The second up is coming in the same division. It's going to be the Cincinnati Reds, who did overtake the Cubs. Um, they are now in second, and they are seven and three in their last 10. Yeah. The Reds, I saw, I was up close and personal with them. The Padres actually, you know, had their way with them. The one thing I will say about the Reds, the thing that's going to keep this team out of the postseason um, and probably keep this team, I, I, I think that the Cubs will kind of get things together and probably finish in second maybe. Um, the, the Reds' bullpen might be the worst bullpen in all of baseball. Um, maybe not maybe uh, Arizona and Baltimore, but in terms of like competitive baseball, uh, the, the, the Reds bullpen is atrocious folks. Uh, it's, it's really bad. The Padres, one of those delays, Trent Grisham hit a, a grand slam. The Padres ended up going up seven to five in the, I think the fifth or sixth inning. And then the rains came and they ended up calling the game. A great start from Luis Castillo wasted with one pitch. I believe it was Amir Garrett. Um, just really, really tough look for the, for the Cincinnati Reds but they are taking advantage of the fact that the Chicago Cubs are struggling and taking advantage of all of this is the Brewers who just seem to be fully running away. But the, the Cincinnati Reds can hit and if their bullpen can somehow like get back to average, we'll see um, what can happen there. But for now, you, they definitely have to be a team on the up, moving up because of, of course, our uh, first down being the Cubs. And our second down is another team that at least I have no problem putting here because uh, I'm not a big fan of the New York Yankees, a team that's barely above 500 now, a team that was the favorite to win the American League pennant at the beginning of the year, according to most odds makers, probably won't even uh, finish at 500. Let's be honest. This is a team that hasn't dealt with nearly as many. I know they have injury issues. Don't get me wrong. But compared to years past, um, it's not nearly what they've gone through normally. Um, obviously, the Garrett Cole situation with his numbers dropping since the sick, sticky stuff has been outlawed. Um, it's, it's really tough as the Yankees, I think, now are, as they look here, 10 and a half games out of the AL East. Uh, let me just pull this up. Yes, 10 and a half games out of the, uh, from the Boston Red Sox, a team who they have yet to beat this entire season. It's kind of a rivalry if you didn't already know. But the New York Yankees. Definitely our second down. What are your thoughts, Brianna? I mean, look, they lost two of three to the Angels last week. Don't get me wrong. I'm not complaining. But they got lucky that that last one did get rained out or whatever the weather was because the Angels probably would have won third. And look, if you're looking at the league standings, the Angels are right behind them. So the Yankees are five, like just over 500. The Angels are at 500. So the fact that the Angels have been able to catch up and they have not done well since the Twins COVID incident, I mean, Yankees have no excuse. They don't have that. They don't have the injuries. They don't, they didn't have the COVID issue. They should be doing a lot better than this. Don't get me wrong. I'm not complaining. Uh, sorry to my Yankee loving friends. I know of one. Yeah. Uh, I'm sorry. It, it, it's it's kind of odd that it was kind of a Corey Kluber injury that just kind of derailed this team. You wouldn't really expect that. Um, I know he threw a no hitter, but hard to kind of think he was the cog keeping that machine together. But the Yankees, I, if there's one thing to say for the Yankees at the trade deadline, if they choose to do so, you know, they can go out and buy, buy, buy if they choose to do so once again, but they might blow it up and uh, try and rebuild for a couple years down the road. Um, we'll see how that goes with the trade deadline uh, looming in a couple weeks. But moving on to our third and final up of the week. It is the 39 and 46 Tigers. Uh, they are now in third in the American League Central after Minnesota and obviously Kansas City have uh, not done well. Uh, but Kansas City did so well. And look, Detroit is the team that's right behind the Angels in the American League. And they did not do well against the Angels. 
So I don't see them staying on an up list for long. It all just depends on who their schedule is. But you never know with the All Star break. But they are seven and three in their last ten games. Yeah, this is, uh, you know, if you go back and before we before the season started, um, we did you know division breakdowns, you know where the teams are going to line up, uh, you know bold predictions, things like that. In the AL Central, I was dead wrong on the winner, dead wrong. I'm ready to put my hands up and say I I I messed up. Uh, the Minnesota Twins are not going to win the AL Central. I thought they were. They are not. But there was one thing that I did say, I think a bold prediction. I said the Tigers will finish in third. And now granted, I thought it would be the Indians that they would be above, not the Twins. So, you know, maybe not the, 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 the order incorrectly. Hey, but I, I was right on my, on my number one. So there you, go. you are correct. And that was- I, I think I put one. Detroit as number three too. There you go. And, and I, that was kind of the one that I think we both kind of went, okay, you know, we'll agree to disagree on, on, on that. And you definitely- uh, called that one correctly. As it, it, like said, for the White Sox, it's all speed. for the White Sox. It's all going to depend on injuries at this point. Yeah, I, and, they're, and they're all they lose by Gorilla Glue right now. Really strong Gorilla Glue, but eventually, you know, if one more, it's going to take a off, toll on them. It's going to yeah. take a toll. Yeah, I think it'll, it'll take a toll in October. I think they win this division, but they're going to struggle um, in in the playoffs with depth and things like that. But the Tigers, they're a young team, and with young teams. They get better as the season goes on for a multitude of reasons. Mainly, you know, look, let's be honest. This team, the pressure is kind of off now. The pressure was never really on for this team. Nobody really expected a whole lot. But now, you know, hey, third place, that that gets you a pat on the head. Most teams, that gets people fired. You know, and then for the Tigers, they have so many, not only young talents, but they're, they're getting their feet wet and they're finally comfortable. They're figuring their roles out, things like that. Tigers probably going to finish with 75 wins, which is respectable. Um, but this isn't a team this year that will be, you know, fighting for a, a playoff spot, but they're definitely a team on the rise. Uh, I'm, I'm excited to see this team because they have a lot of good young pitching. They have Spencer Torkelson, who just apparently just mashes bombs. We might see him later in the year, uh, former Arizona state sun devil. So uh, really, really excited to see what the Tigers have in store for the rest of the year. But uh, I don't think they're going to be making this list too much more. It could be wrong, um, but we'll see how that goes. But our final, third and final down of the week is also in the American League Central. It is the Cleveland Indians. Now, they didn't really move up or down in the division. They're just losing ground on the Chicago White Sox. Obviously, the White Sox lead the American League Central by six full games now. The Cleveland Indians are one and nine in their last seven, including seven straight losses. Still have a four and a half game lead on the Detroit Tigers for second place. So they're not really going to move up or down, um, or at least not yet. But in terms of moving away from the division lead, uh, that is definitely the Cleveland Indians. I mean, look. <laughs> I believed that the Cleveland Indians, I think, were going to be fourth. I mean, we kind of knew that Kansas City was going to be where they're at. We didn't expect them to do that well. But again, All-Star Weekend could turn it around and the White Sox can go down and the Cleveland Indians can go up. We'll never know until we get there. But, I mean, the Indians just need to do better. Yeah, this is a team, obviously, that's struggling without their best pitcher, Shane Bieber. Um, they are still coming off of the situation of losing their best player in Francisco Lindor. Uh, and to be honest, I was surprised that they were as competitive as they were for as long as they were. But like we said, I think with just similar to what the White Sox were just kind of holding our breath, like, okay, keep going, guys. Because I think that's this entire division at this point. <laughs> yeah, it, every single team in this division is a negative in the run differential, minus, of course, the White Sox. Um, but for the Indians, they're, I guess, kind of a surprise right now for me, at least. I know they're obviously they're on a down stretch right now, but to be 500 for a team that's lost its best pitcher and traded away its best hitter um, and a, a fan base that's really been very frustrated with ownership, I think they got to feel okay. I don't think anyone's writing home about it, especially in a, on a seven game losing streak. But uh, for them to be in second place, I definitely didn't expect it, um, nor did you, but we'll, we'll see how that goes. It's a perfect little segue into um, 
kind of a full standings update as we go through. We are hitting pretty much the unofficial halfway point of the season. We will start in the American League East. We had kind of already touched on it, but it is the Boston Red Sox at 54 and 32 with a uh, four and a half game lead on the Tampa Bay Rays, who are 49 and 36. Toronto Blue Jays are 43 and 39, nine games behind the Red Sox. New York Yankees, 42 and 41, 10 and a half back of Boston. And uh, those, they, they try, folks. The Baltimore Orioles, 27 and 57. They are a healthy uh, 26 games back uh, in the middle of the three game losing streak. Brianna, um, not a big surprise, at least uh, at the bottom um, with Baltimore, but what are your thoughts on the American League East so far in the first you know, three months of the year? I mean, it's a surprise where the Yankees are. Um, to be honest, I thought it was going to be Boston. Um, Boston has just basically surprised all of us. I'm just glad Toronto is up there because I do want to see them make it that far. But Boston is leading the entire American League, and I don't think that's going to change that much. Either way, I think Boston's going to make this playoff. Yeah, they've, they've gotten so they're, – they're pitching compared to last year, uh, night and day. Um, and, and they're nine and one, as we kind of talked about, this is a team starting to pull away from the pack, the Tampa Bay Rays, um, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, interesting in this situation, first of all, one thing that's very interesting is Toronto, Tampa, both have a better run differential than the Red Sox. Um, it's kind of ironic there, Toronto plus 73, Tor uh, Tampa Bay. Uh, plus 67 and Boston plus 64. So in those situations, obviously Toronto um, getting those big wins, but I, I really expected more from the Yankees. Like you said, Tampa Bay though, they get one all-star in every team needs to be represented. They get Mike Zunino in who's not even hitting 200. I hate to say it, but that's kind of like a perfect microcosm for how Tampa Bay is. Um, individually, they're not very good, but Kevin Cash puts these guys together so that they're in um, the best possible scenario to win and to succeed. And now obviously four and a half games back, nothing to write home about, but Tampa Bay, low budget, kind of a bunch of nobodies, if you will. Um, still kind of getting it done, hanging around, at least in the wild card. Um, I'll, I'll kind of go through that here in a minute, but moving to the American League Central, we already kind of talked about the dumpster fire that this division is. Um, if you're not the Chicago White Sox, you are uh, struggling. But it is the White Sox at 49 and 35, leading the division despite a three-game losing streak. Still up on the Indians by six games. Obviously, excuse me, uh, seven straight losses. The Indians are 42 and 40. The Detroit Tigers, as we talked about, on the rise, 39 and 46, 10 and a half games back. Those damn Minnesota Twins. Um, barely, barely above um, the seller at four, 35 and 48, 13 and a half games back. And the Kansas City Royals struggling big time, 35 and 49, 14 games back. Uh, we kind of already talked about this division in depth, so I'm just going to kind of uh, jump over to Brianna's neck of the woods in the American League. I'm so West. Mad. <laughs> Yeah, uh, at the top. Now, the only positive for me in this situation, I do have a futures bet for the Astros to win the division. So yeah, no, I, I hate them, but I'm going to make money off of them. Um, but anyways, the Houston Astros are winners of four straight and are 52 and 33, three and a half game lead on the Oakland A's at 39 and 30, or excuse me, 49 and 37. The very, very surprising and underrated, not talked about too much Seattle Mariners, 45 and 40, seven games back. Of course, the Anaheim angels, 42 and 42, nine and a half games back. And there's always seems to be one team in every division, but it's the Texas Rangers well off the lead. 33 and 52, 19 games back. Uh, Brianna, obviously it's it's tough at the top. Nobody wants to see that team at the top. But what are your thoughts? And the A's were doing so well. Yeah. And then just turned into a dumpster fire. But Seattle, I mean, we talked about it earlier with all the com or earlier before the season, I think, started. With all the comments that were made, there was going to be a fire lit under them. I kind of actually want to see them in first, but at the same time, I do want the angels to overtake them. I need somebody to overtake those Astros though. Yeah. I hate to say it, but if the Mariners finish in first, the angels are finishing fourth. 
So I, I be careful what you wish for on that one. Um, no, no, there's a chance. Well, yeah, there's definitely, there could be craziness, 100%. With Mike Trout back, um, there could be a chance. Yeah, you're right. That's that's kind of the big kind of caveat. The, the interesting thing, of course, the American League wild card, you'll get two teams in. Right now, it's Tampa Bay and Oakland, who um, right now Tampa Bay has a half game lead on Oakland, which would essentially host that game. But once again, right outside of that is the Seattle Mariners at three and a half games back, Toronto, Cleveland, the Angels, and then, of course, those Tigers. But, um, you know, the Angels are kind of the last team that are, that are there contending six games back of a playoff spot. Plenty of time to make up six games, especially uh, with the talent the Angels have. And have with the there. fact that they're playing the Mariners for yeah, six or seven true. games in the next two weeks. And that all counts for a game. So yep. you never know. Could uh, go five and two, six and one against that team, and, and they will be – probably either right there on their heels or ahead of them. But uh, moving on to the National League side of things, we'll start in the NL East, which um, they, they, the division's gotten better as a whole, but it's still a little weak. Uh, the New York Mets leading the division by four games at 44 and 37, um, by far the worst record of any division leader in baseball. The Washington Nationals, 41 and 42, are four games back. The Atlanta Braves still struggling 41 and 43, four and a half games back 40 and 42 is the Philadelphia Phillies four and a half games back in the Miami Marlins. They're only nine games back at 36 and 47 big surprises here. Um, I know I fully expected Atlanta to run away with this division. I expected the Mets to be good. I expected the Phillies to be okay. Did not expect the, the nationals to kind of be in this spot now 41 and 42 once again, not um, anything that puts the fear of anyone into that, but a team that's also dealt with a lot of injuries, an old team as well. Uh, Brianna, what are your thoughts on the National League East uh, here on July 6th? I believe I had the Marlins in last, mm -hmm. either way. Um, I think that's I like had Washington. That's like a free space, though. That's like a free Yeah. Space. I think I had Washington sort of four. I knew the Mets were going to be good, somewhat good. I knew that they were going to be toward the top, so I don't care about that one Atlanta I thought was going to do better <laughs> I yeah. think Atlanta is the team that has honestly surprised all of us aside from how bad those Diamondbacks are <laughs> but again we'll get to that you know yeah there's but yeah the, we when we do the uh three up three down or at least the downside of things we only consider 29 teams once again you can always consider the arizona diamondbacks as one of our downs but if uh, there's nothing else yeah yeah exactly that that's another free space one thing that's very interesting and i know run differential isn't the end all be all but for me i always like to kind of look at it you know what the team that has the highest run differential in this entire division and it's Miami. by a lot it's the Miami, Miami Marlins. Marlins. I'm looking at it right now. <laughs> They're plus 20 in the, in, the, uh, in the run differential category. New York Mets are plus seven, and the Atlanta Braves are plus six. I, that's just, it's crazy to me um, to see that, and I think it kind of goes to the, the mediocrity of this division. Um, obviously, any team in the National League West would be far and away leading this division, um, especially the Padres. Um, obviously, that doesn't matter. But the National League East has gotten better because I think the last time we did a standing up update, it was a 500 team that was at the top. So at least the Mets are seven games above 500 now. But moving to the Central, that really, to be honest, uh, we expected this to be kind of the, the, the division that struggled. But the Milwaukee Brewers have been on a tear, maybe not so much of late. They've lost two straight, but they had won, I think, 11 in a row prior to that. They are 51 and 35. Um, to have a six-game lead over the Cincinnati Reds, who are 44 and 40. Those Chicago Cubs, who are in the middle of, you know, that roughness, are 42 and 43, eight and a half games back. The St. Louis Cardinals, another team that's struggling um, without their ace, Jack Flaherty, 42 and 44, nine games back, and then we got to bring them up. But it is the Pittsburgh Pirates, 31 and 53. They are 19 games back. Um Really, really interesting for me. Of course, I'm going to pat myself on the back. Um, I picked the Brewers to win the division. It does look like that's going to happen. I also have a futures bet in on them too. So that's a positive. Uh, but the NL Central, I think better than advertised, but not great. Uh, well, I believe I had the Brewers in first as well. I think I had the Cardinals 
in second, and they have just fallen flat on their faces. I don't know what happened, but it's not good for them. Cubs, I believe I thought they were going to be fourth just because of how many players they did lose last year. Um, and then also going back to the Angels really quick, because this just came up, Rendon is back on the aisle. <laughs> Yikes. Uh, yeah, death taxes and Rendon on the aisle, apparently. Um, unfortunately. For the third really, time this season. <laughs> really, I feel like that's like the sixth time in the last year and a half. I mean, technically, we probably just played. We haven't even played 100 62 games that Rendon has been on the Angels, and I think he's been on the IL five times, but yikes, that's unfortunate. Um, Hope he can but then healthy. Pittsburgh, we knew it was going to be so Yeah, yeah. Pittsburgh, yeah. That's Pittsburgh is a free space. spot. Yeah, that's a free space. Um, and I think in the West, we were between those two teams in that free spot. <laughs> yeah, um, I, 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 I think the, the roles would have been reversed. We'll get to the West here in one minute. The last thing I do want to say about the Central, um, the Cubs, 42 and 43, if you would have told me at the beginning of the year that would be their record right now, I would have said, wow, they're having a really good year. And they have had a good year. Obviously, it's just unfortunate. They are in. They came back to earth hard in the form of a 10-game losing streak. Um, but, you know, for I, I did not expect a ton from this team. They've obviously over, um, prior to, you know, the last two weeks, um, have gone, done very well, struggled, obviously, of late. And, yes, of course, it is the National League West by far the most division maybe the best division in all of baseball san francisco giants lead the way still at 53 and 31 just a half game ahead of the los angeles dodgers at 53 and 32 uh, the san diego padres of course as i talked about 40 uh, four and a half games back at 50 and 37 colorado rockies uh hanging out in that kind of mediocre spot 37 and 48 16 and a half games back, and then by far the worst team in baseball, maybe um, getting to a point where could be talking about 110 game, 110 lost team. Yes, that's the Arizona Diamondbacks, who to this point have only won 23 games. They are 23 and 63, 40 games below 500, if my math is correct, and I believe it is. They are 31 games back. Um, they're going to be they're going to be mathematically eliminated in the middle of August. This is, this is just a disaster for the, the Diamondbacks. I actually had, I believe, the Diamondbacks maybe third, maybe fourth. Um, I had the Rockies in the, in, the, in the cellar, I'll be honest with you. Um, I obviously did not have the Giants. I think the highest I had the Giants was third. Um, I expected this to be a two-team race between the Dodgers and Padres. But, you know, you just got to kind of accept the fact that the Dodgers are probably going to be sticking around all summer. Um, and that's kind of a little disheartening if you're a Padre fan, because we thought we were going to have to just deal with the Dodgers, but apparently the Giants are there to be dealt with as well. But Brianna, what are your thoughts on the ultra competitive National League West? I mean, I believe I had Arizona and Colorado there, but I did have San Francisco in third. Look, we didn't expect them to be this good, especially after last year and what they were able to do in the off season, which wasn't really a lot. So... I mean, the Giants are just surprising. They are leading the entirety of the National League. Obviously, that's only by half a game. But, I mean, I kind of want to see the Giants win. And I want the Padres to be in second. J just yeah. so the Dodgers just go further down. And yeah, don't and even the Rockies. Let's, make let's a get the Rockies or the, the, the Reds rolling. And let's try and get the Dodgers out of out of the playoffs in general. And you know, Yeah. But if that only. might be... That might be a bit uh, wishful thinking there, a little greedy on our I part. I can hope. I can yeah, hope. Oh, yeah, 100%. Keep our fingers crossed. Who knows? You know, like we said, the Dodgers, unfortunately, we started the show off with, you know, that situation. In terms of the National League wild card, um, at the moment, the Dodgers, um, obviously, four games ahead of the Padres, and then the um, Padres are four and a half games ahead of the Cincinnati Reds, so not really a whole lot of movement at the moment. Obviously, if you're a Padre fan, you're looking up. You're trying to hopefully get into that, um, you know, at least second place so that you're hosting the wild card game. You want that situation. Um, but I will say the, uh, the, the wild card game doesn't scare me that much for a couple reasons. And mainly is because they have an ace in you, Darvish, or Joe Musgrove. I mean, you can kind of take your pick. I would obviously would like to see you. Um, be that guy but Joe can also be that guy so 
that makes me feel better because you, you need an ace in that one game playoff. You need to be able to set yourself up to have your best pitching staff going on that one game. Um, at the very least, if you're going into the last game of the season where you need to win to get in, it's going to be very difficult to set your pitching staff up. So the way it's looking right now, if we go into the final week of the season and the Padres have already clinched, you know, even if it's just the, the second place wild card, at least they can set up their pitching staff to give them a fighter's chance against probably either the Giants or the Dodgers, but we'll see how that goes. The National League wild card looks kind of wrapped up, um, probably going to get three teams into the playoffs out of the National League West and the division, uh, the second place and third place team will have to play a wild card game more than likely, which will be kind of odd because they're probably going to have a better record than both the National League East winners and the National League Central winners, but it is what it is. Nothing you can really do about that. So um, final thoughts, Brianna, um, on the final changeup before the All-Star break. I want Hotani to win. I just want him to prove to everybody that two-way players are possible and they can win a home run derby. I think that uh, that's definitely been proven. Um, I think it's, like I said- Now he just needs to back. win. Yeah, exactly. And, and win in more ways, like obviously look, win the home run derby, yes, but I keep saying it, just get Trout healthy, get this team into the- He's crowd. getting there. He's Baseball getting there. Baseball is less off. This is the only sport- currently right now where the best player or players in the game consistently are missing the playoffs in you know at the moment or you know the past couple years it's been Mike Trout now obviously Shohei Otani is at the front Um, he's obviously the MVP once again there is no debate Um, I don't think it's fair of Vladimir Guerrero because to be honest um, he can only do one thing Uh, he he plays he plays a good first base don't get me wrong but not hard not hardly the toughest position to play um he smashes don't get me wrong but guess what so does Shohei and then every fifth day he absolutely stuffs it at the uh uh, stuffs it up the pitcher uh, aside from that one day well yeah and they look I mean everyone's gonna have a rough day um not everyone's DeGrom and it's Yankee Stadium I think maybe the the you know what it's the Jay-Z if you you can make it here you can make it anywhere and I think that's the case it probably got to him you know the big bright lights of Yankee Stadium was that his first time at Yankee Stadium I hate to put you on the spot but if you know off the top of your head, I feel like it was, or at least pitching there, it probably was. So could have got to him. Um, but, you know, I, I don't think that's the, you know, the be more of what we're going to see down the stretch. Um, but I can't wait to see what he has in store. Um, I, I just, I, I think history. to hit more line drives in that home run derby. Um, Cause you got to wait for that ball to land before you get the next ball. I think his moon shots are great, but um, might run out of steam. Who knows? We'll see. I'm really excited for the home run derby. I do know that. So with that, thank you all so much for listening to the change up here on the first off the bench podcast network. Everyone comes off the bench. We are first. It is time for you all to go wash your hands and stop hating everybody. We'll talk to you all very soon. Take care.